Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is Gary Rich, CEO of the WD-40 company. Um, the uh, LinkedIn Live show that I do is all about grace and how we prepare ourselves to connect more effectively with others. Uh, grace Under Pressure de uh, uh, deals with what we all too often dismiss as the soft stuff, the caring, the commitment uh, that we care toward others. And when you do it as a leader, as Gary is, you discover um, grace is about generosity, respect, compassion. And when you do it as a leader, uh, you take it to another dimension. So welcome, Gary Ridge. It's a privilege to have you on the show. Okay, John, it's great to be with you here today. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, let me tell folks all about you. Uh, Gary uh, Ridge is the chairman and CEO of the WD-40 company, which operates in a mere 178 countries. So it's truly global. Uh, he's responsible for developing and implementing the strategies, operations, and relationships. And you're going to discover just how committed Gary is to developing relationships. Uh, Gary joined WD-40 company in 1987, has rose through the ranks. Uh, you're also... Uh, an uh, adjunct professor at the University of San Diego, where you teach leadership development, talent, talent management, succession, and participate in an executive leadership program. You co-authored a book with Ken Blanchard, Outlining Effective Leadership Techniques, titled Helping People Win at Work, a business philosophy called Don't Mark My Paper, Help me get an A. Love that title. Uh, Gary's a native of Australia, and he um, joins us today from San Diego. Welcome, Gary. It's a privilege to have you here. So. Thanks, John. It's great to be with you today. Cool. My pleasure. Uh, great. There's a little bit of a, a buzz on your game. Could you turn on, Mike, could you turn on just a touch? Sorry. So, okay. Great. Um, What's the outlook? We were talking before the outlook for 2021. What are you seeing? What are you hearing from your colleagues or peers? So, well, it depends where you are around the world, John. Um, you know, this COVID roller coaster has been an interesting one. Um, to me, it was a bit like the Indiana Jones movie where the the boulder was chasing him through the cave. <laughs> um, and we've watched it because we have operations in China. We watched it start there January a year ago. I was actually in Italy when it broke out in Europe, and um, we've been watching markets turn on, turn off. For us as a company, it's been a real, um, a rich learning experience. Um, leading in through a, a crisis or a pandemic has been a rich learning experience, and uh, you know, business-wise, we've benefited from what we're calling isolation renovation. Um, that squeaky door that you had at home that you only heard twice a day when you went in and out, you're now hearing 40 times a day. So we're very fortunate that uh, as far as our, our company is concerned, we've done reasonably well through this period of time. That's great. Um, ter terrific. So uh, I'll let's take it back a little bit. There's a wonderful book by our uh, friends. Excuse me. I'll just try to get this. Uh, Leading with Gratitude by... Um, Chester Elton and Adrian Gostick, and you feature are featured in this. And there's a wonderful story in there um, about um, about where we were in 2008. So uh, tell us about this. How are we doing? And what did you tell your people back then? So yeah, you know, 2008 was kind of quote unquote the Great Recession, and uh, I, it was interesting. As I was flying around the world, one of the things people asked me often was, "How are you, Gary?" And, and I noticed that it, it was, you know, more often than normal. And what became very clear to me was, as a leader, they weren't asking me how I was. They were asking me how we were as an organization. And that was a great learning because, you know, as we lead through difficult times, people in organizations are wanting to be sure they understand that uncertainty is a series of future events that may or may not occur. And our job as a leader is to try and sort those may and may not occur uh, you know, uh, situations so people don't you know, get over anxious because we do get over anxious. That's such, yeah, that's such a powerful story. How are you when actually it's 
how are we? And that's such, an, uh, such a w uh, great way of articulating what the role of a leader is. It's, I like to say, it's not about you, but it's all about you in a way. And you were living that balance in that one phrase, you know, how are you? So, um, and uh, I want to tell folks, you were just named and you are, I think, the only executive that I know of who was named a global guru. Uh, I've been associated with them for many, many years now. And you're the first executive that named and uh, in top uh, org leader for organizational culture. And I think I know why, Gary. It's because unlike many of your peers, you are a prolific writer and you share um, what's going on and you share, you're not afraid to share from the heart. So tell us about what led you to your writing and your blogging. So um, I think as leaders, we have a responsibility and, and I, I'll describe it this way. Imagine a place where you go to work every day, you make a contribution to something bigger than yourself. You learn something new, you're protected and set free by a compelling set of values and you go home happy. Our job as leaders is to create that place because happy people create happy families, happy families create happy communities and happy communities create a happy world and my gosh, we need a happy world. But unfortunately, what happens is leaders like this guy, Al the soul sucking CEO, <laughs> creates, create these toxic environments where people don't like going to work. Right. Now, Aristotle, in three, who was born in 384, 384 BC, said, pleasure in the job puts perfection in the work. So truly, it is our role as leaders yeah. to, to create a place where people actually like going to work and enjoy what they do. Since you introduced that character, um, any specific behaviors that the soul sucker is noted for? Gary. Oh, yeah. You know, he's the master of control. He's the know-it-all. He's corporate royalty. He's, you know, he's, he's spent a lot of time fighting his way up the, the corporate royalty channel. He thinks learning is, learning is for losers because he has all the answers. Most particularly, his ego eats his empathy instead of his empathy eating his ego. Um, he, he must always be right. He, he, he loves fear-based culture. Micromanagement is essential. He doesn't follow through in what he does, and he hates feedback. <laughs> That's great. Other than that, does he have any other uh, any other virtues? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I'm sure those that are with us today, as I, I was as I was sharing those behaviors, were going, "Yeah, I, I've met, I've met, I've met Al. I've seen <laughs> Al. Oh, and, yeah. you know, and he calls here. You know, he, they've seen him somewhere." Yeah, they have. But you know what? I'm just not to, to um, poor Al here. They do. And you described it wonderfully. And, and I like the way you um, all those iterations. But such leaders like that are I wouldn't call them leaders. Such executives like that live a life in constant fear. Don't you think, Gary? So, yeah, I, I think they do fear. They, they, they're they afraid of being themselves. You know, leadership is is also about being vulnerable. There were three, you know, when you introduced me earlier, um, I, I have a different way of introducing myself. I say, hi, I'm Gary Ridge. I'm the chairman of, of the consciously incompetent <laughs> and probably wrong and roughly right chairman and CEO of WD-40 company. And the reason I say that is the three most important words I learned a long time ago and I had to get comfortable with are, I don't know. Mm. And you know that's and, and I think the 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 owls of the world who live in fear are not comfortable with vulnerability. We you know we don't have all the answers, um, and and we need to have people to help us get the answers. But and 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 that comes up a lot. And I've talked about I I don't know, and I I do a lot of coaching with senior leaders. And here's the thing, and I and so what's your advice? Senior leaders are often comfortable saying, I don't know. But what about when you're rising through the ranks, Gary, and I, and I come in and I'm pitching you and my idea and you say, John, tell me about this. And I am dear caught in the headlights. So what words of advice do you have? <laughs> um, the words of advice are, I don't know, but together we can find the, the better answer together. That's really what the answer is, you know. Yeah. And, you know, I love when, when people you know, have different points of view, asking the question, what evidence would change your mind? 
Because as Brené Brown says, in the absence of facts and data, we make up stories and then they become our truth. Wow. So, you know, why can't we ask ourselves, you know, about a belief, you know, and, and in the book, Who Moved My Cheese, there was a follow on called Out of the Maze. And it says, you know, a belief is a thought that you trust to be true. So the question to ask yourself is, why do I believe what I believe? Can I trust this to be true? Right. And again, our job as leaders is to bring out the best of people. Absolutely. So you have a five point model on this yes. and begins with people. Um, so what's the people equation? I mean, we say it all the time, but how do you how do we genuinely live that principle, Gary? Well, it's based on the fact that there are two things that you need to be successful in business. You need the will of the people and then you need a strategy to execute around. So let's say, for example, you know, we've got a strategy and it's scored by Harvard Business School of, you know, out of one to 100 at, at 70. But let's say the will of the people and the engagement of the people is 10. 10 times 70 is 700. Now, most strategies are probably 50-50. So let's say you've got a strategy scored at 50, but the will of the people is 80, i.e. your employee engagement is 80. 80 times 50 is 4,000. So the first thing our job as a leader is to create a culture where the will of the people and the engagement of the people is high. So to go around that model, the next thing is purpose. People want to have a purpose or a just cause. Our just cause at WD40 Company is to make life better at work and at home. That's why we come to work every day. We don't sell oil in a can. We're in the memories business. We exist to create positive, lasting memories by solving problems in factories, homes, and workshops around the world. So now you've got people and you've got a purpose. The next one is values. And values are part of a culture. My culture equation is culture equals values plus behavior times consistency. So if you want to build a strong culture, you have to have a clear set of values. And as a leader, you have to love your people enough and be brave enough to both reward them and applaud them for doing wonderful work and to redirect them when they need to be coached in a different area. And if you do that, and then the other two areas are strategy and execution. Mm -hmm. So you've got to have a great strategy and a bold execution. And then finally, you have to be a learning organization. And we say, we do not make mistakes we have learning moments. And here's the difference. A learning moment is a positive or negative outcome of any situation that needs to be openly and freely shared to benefit all people. And why do we call it a learning moment? Because we want to take fear out. People have fear of failure. Well, you don't fail. You have a circumstance where you learn something. Right. And part of the, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, when you create these learning moments and you take fear out of failure, it's a sense of freedom, which is that correct? So, yes, yeah, it's a sense of freedom. And, you know, we say at the company, you can make any decision you need to make wherever you are. You don't have to quack up the hierarchy as long as you make that decision based on our values and you share the learning afterwards, positive or negative learning. Great. And so now we have our phrase that I like to use for where we are, um, an upside down world. So um, taking these five principles, um, how do we find hope in this um, upside down world? Is Do our five principles help us or what, what have you found, Gary? So, well, you must have hope because if you don't have hope, you're hopeless. And being hopeless means you're not going to deliver on, on what you want to do. So Yes, of course you have hope, but, but also hope is about having pragmatic optimism. So you've got to be pragmatic and optimistic at the same time. And both. And, and one of the, the key attributes that our servant leader, other side has, is he is a champion of hope or she is a champion of hope. If you think about the opposite to Al's behaviours, here they are. The servant leader always involves their people. They're always in servant leadership mode. They're expected to be competent. They are connected with emotional intelligence. They love learning moments. They have a heart of gold and a backbone of steel. They are champions of hope. 
They know micromanagement is not scalable. They do what they say they're going to do, and they love feedback. And taking those together create an environment where people can thrive. Great. And <clears throat> okay, and all, all of it sounds good. And I know your company practices that. How do you ensure, at no, in your level and people you meet, how do you ensure that those behaviors are modeled by managers throughout the organization, Gary? Zero tolerance. And it's embedded in the book I wrote with Ken Blanchard. We talk about how our values are actually embedded in the quarterly conversations we have with our people. So we ask our people to share with us on a quarterly basis, how did you live our values? Give us an example. And we only have two measurements. You either live them or you visit them. And we don't want a lot of visitors. <laughs> That's, I either live or visit. I like that. That's a good. You, you, you write so crisply and you speak this, so you give us vivid images. So thank you. That's great. Now, I'm told that you spend the first two hours of every day with your people. Explain that. What does that mean? So. Well, when I was in, in when we were in physical, um, in our physical offices together, you know, I, I'm, I'm an early starter. I'm usually up around four in the morning. And I would make sure that before I came to the office every day, I cleared out the disruption so that I could spend my time wandering around or talking to people. Now, what I do every morning is I send a message out to our tribe globally, and it's called From Today. And it usually used to be from today from London or Sydney or Barcelona, but it's from today from where I live in San Diego for the last year. Yeah. And that's an, it's an inspirational connection with people to help them start their day. So I, I really believe our job is to get the busy work out of the way. And then we have to connect with the people because if we don't know how our people feel and what they're doing, we won't, how can we how can we lead? And you told me something when we were talking before, Gary, and I ask you about when we have the all clear in our new normal and it's safe to travel widely, um, you are going to get back on the road and go see people. And why, why, is, that, why is that important to you? So. Um, to be connected to the people. You know, you have to listen to your people you, and you, you've got to be there to understand, to feel their empathy. You know, I had a beautiful, there's a beautiful definition of empathy. I think um, it came from, it might have came from Martin Lindstrom, our, our friend who wrote the book. Yeah. But he said the difference between sympathy and empathy. You know, if we're both out on a boat on the ocean and we're standing near the rail and I'm throwing up and you come to me and you say, Gary, I, I'm sorry you don't feel well. Here's a tissue to wipe your mouth. That's sympathy. When you start throwing up next to me, that's empathy. <laughs> that sounds like Martin, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we as leaders have to feel our people to have empathy. Right. And I'm, I'm so glad you raised the topic of empathy because I, I've written about it and written around it. And my, here's my philosophy, and I bounced it off a few psychologists or psychiatrists. And I've said that empathy is just what you said, that feeling the other pain. But Larry or Gary, would you agree that from a leadership standpoint, you have to do something about it. So um, act, acting on empathy. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You, right. you, you, you take it in and you need to do something about it. Great. Um, good. So what is, um, you said this great early about there are no mistakes. There's opportunities for learning. And how do you make that real by embedding it in the culture? And do you have an example how that is driven for driven home? So. Oh, yeah. You know, we 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 are just continual learners, continual curiosity about what we do. And within the organization, we have many streams of learning opportunities. The the master's degree in leadership that I took 21 or so years ago when I met my mentor, Ken Blanchard uh, from USD that I actually now teach in, we've put 34 people through that program. And then we have within the organization what we call our leadership laboratory, where I think the last count in the last three years, we'd, we had had somewhere in the vicinity of 40,000 hours of leadership development training in the company globally, because we think it's so important. Right. We know, it's funny, we don't teach people how to be lead, the, the attributes of leadership. Mm -hmm. You know, here's a new job, you're a manager. Now, we don't call our managers managers here. They're coaches. Ah, 
Ah, wonderful because example. The yeah. coach's job is to help those they coach succeed. And the, the great coaches don't run onto the field and pick up the ball. They're on the sideline and in the locker room observing the play, looking for the performance opportunities and sharing with that with those they coach. So no lead, no managers at WD40 Company, we're all coaches. Great. Now, I'm going to guess that one of the ways you reinforce this culture of coaching, this culture of leadership development, of bringing people together, and you said it right at the beginning, we want to come to work for something greater than ourselves. You have the tradition of campfire stories. Tell us about that, Gary. So, Yeah, one of the wonderful stories that we have is when we come together um, for our global leadership meetings, um, we, we gather around a, a fireplace and you on a three by five card you write on something you write something that you either want to release to the universe or you want to um, expand to the universe and people come up and they read what that is and they throw it into the campfire and um, that's just one of the the things that we do and you know people will come in and share that you know they've had a loved one that suffered from some sickness they want to they want to release that to the universe they, yeah. and it's not just business it, most of it's personal and we might have 40 right. or 50 people who are who are coming up and it just bonds us together because sure. we're a tribe we're not a team yeah. we're a you, tribe yeah and I, I, you all you keep coming back to this and i know this about your culture you're a tribe and that and that's such a, an affirming uh thing because it gets to the heart of what we call belonging correct so Right. So one of the biggest it, desires we have as a human being is to belong. Everybody who's listening to us today have, has left an organization, a party, or even a relationship because they didn't feel like they belong. Right. Why do and, people leave? And you have a lovely turn of phrase, and you call it the gift of belonging. Where did that come from? What I think you described it, but just uh, expand on it a bit, Gary. Well, the gift of belonging is remembering that you know, one of the biggest needs we have is that gift of, of actually belonging. And, you know, we talk about our tribe in a way that it's a group of people that come together to both protect and feed each other. Now, you know, we have employee engagement of 93%, 98% of our people say they love to tell people they work at WD-40 company. 97% say they respect their coach. And the reason that we've been successful in the last year is because we had a very engaged tribe who made a commitment a year or so ago. We're going to come together to protect and feed each other. Right. And that's what we went out to do. That's such a powerful example of the tribe. And then talking about uh, um, Nutella, I don't, uh, obviously we use the term belonging all the time, but I've never uh, thought of it as a gift. But as you describe it, it certainly is. I'm fortunate to be here. And then, um, Gary, uh, there's also a sense of commitment to that. If I'm part of belonging to the tribe, I have responsibilities, don't I? So Absolutely. You have responsibilities to the, the tribe members that you're with. Um, that you work with every day. And, and interestingly enough, the number one responsibility of a tribal leader is to be a learner and a teacher. And, and let me give you a really quick example of that. I, we studied the attributes of the indigenous Australians and the Fijian Islanders. And if we were to go back thousands of years and be kind of sneak peeking at a, a tribal meeting of, of indigenous Australians, the tribal leader would be teaching the young tribe members to throw a boomerang. Why? Because the boomerang was this tool of survival. So if he didn't teach his younger tribe members to throw the boomerang, the tribe would eventually go extinct. So our number one responsibility as a tribal leader is to be a learner and a teacher. That's a great, a learner and a teacher. That's it. And then, and I'm glad the teacher we can cotton on to, but the learner. So that gives me to my next thing. You have mentioned his name several times, and he's an icon in the field of human development, Ken Blanchard. You referred to him as your mentor as well as your co-author. So what has Ken's gift to you been, Gary? So You know, I met Ken 21, 22 years ago. He's 81 years old now. He's a dear friend. Uh, we still play golf on a Wednesday afternoon together. Yeah. Um, he lives here in San Diego. And Ken's gift to me was giving me the confidence to be able to really believe that being a servant leader, being someone who was there to serve others, 
he you know Ken says not one of us is as good as all of us. He's big on empathy. So I was on the board of his company for ten years. Mm -hmm. So I got to learn and to be alongside Ken a lot. And I wouldn't be who I am today if it wasn't for Ken Blanchard. Yeah. Well, what a good tribute because you are such a respected leader um, as your recent accolades show. But I know you're also, like me, a member of MG100 and you're one of our esteemed members. You have a real job, not like <laughs> coaches like me. <laughs> so anyway, that's it, it's quite good. So I want to touch on one more thing, and that's your... You, have, uh, you teach leadership. What has teaching leadership taught you about being a leader, being a CEO? So. Well, I, I think the greatest way to learn is to teach. And I'm so grateful that, you know, for the last 12 or so years, I've been able to gather with cohorts of people and really examine and talk about some of the principles of leadership we have. And, and, you know, one of the advantages that I have in teaching that program is I'm not an academic, I'm a practitioner. So being able to share my scar tissue has been really, really a benefit. Okay. And scar tissue might be mistakes made or regrets or what? Learning moments. We don't make mistakes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Learning moments. Okay. That's great. Um, so I know you, and I ask every guest, um, as we're coming toward the end of our show, um, uh, about grace. Do you have a, something you want to share with us, Gary? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, John. I, I was reflecting on that, and I, Mark Goldston, I don't know if you know Mark. I do know Mark. I do know yeah. Mark. Yes. I, you know, he's he's a great guy, and he, he, he said something that really resonated with me, and it is... Grace is when you can listen to others from and with love. And when I think about it, this last year has been a time as a leader, we needed to listen to people from love and with love because everybody was going through their own personal hero's journey. And one of the things that I'm really focusing on right now is re-entry because the person that we said see you Monday morning to a year ago is not the same person we're going to say hi to on the Monday morning when we get back to the office. That's such a great way of putting it. And um, and I've been thinking lately is that all the challenges that we've gone through in this past year, we have to learn something from this. We have to make that these tragedies uh, 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 work for us. So as you think of re-entry, is there one or two points that come to mind, Gary? So, um, Yeah, I think if you think about re-entry, it's, it's like when a, the spaceship is coming back from the moon and it goes through that, that atmosphere. And, and as it comes through the atmosphere, there's heat and turbulence and whatever. So our job as leaders is to understand what the heat and turbulence has been for someone. And then to have grace, to okay. listen to them from and with love and to reconnect those relationships again, because relationships are so important. They are. And it's it's so and I think that they have sustained us even virtually. Um, I know that um, uh, I've watched people around us and leaders I work with, even my wife, who just before she retired, was managing her team, leading her team virtually and, and working hard at it. And it's not easy. <laughs> you know, you really get stretched. So uh, hats off to anybody who has been leading virtually. And then if you were a, if you were a parent uh, with children at home who couldn't go to physical school, I call them the unsung heroes of our time right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Gary, this has been a great thing. How can people find you? Um, so um, I'm on LinkedIn. They can find me. And then I have a website, www.thelearningmoment.net. Great. And I will say, and your blogs are there because, and yes. they're well worth reading. You have um, an elegant turn of phrase. Like you cut to the quick. Um, they're short, they're direct. Um, and, you know, they're very special to me because uh, from a, you are a, a leader at the top of your organization. You wouldn't use that word, but, you know, you have the chief responsibilities and you're opening yourself up and learning and sharing. So thank you. You've been a great guest and it's my honor to have you. So thank you. So, thank you, John. Great. Hey, my pleasure. All right. And...